A few years ago, I made a video about all the different tips and tricks that I use to get faster renders when I'm using Cycles. That video is over four years old now, and there has been quite a few changes to Cycles and Blender in general since then, so I thought it would be a good opportunity to make an updated guide. Before we get started, I just want to say that my course, The Essential Topology Guide, is on sale, but until the end of November, which is tomorrow, so you need to act fast. The Essential Topology Guide is essentially four hours of training covering 34 different topics at the moment, all about how to make really nice models with clean topology. You can save 40% over at Gumroad using the code 40 off at checkout in November. Once that's expired, I will update the description with whatever the best promo code is at the time. So the most important thing that you're going to want to check is that you're using the appropriate device. If you have a GPU, even if it's not as fancy as your CPU, it's probably going to be faster to use that. GPUs, at the end of the day, are designed to do visual calculations. They are designed to create graphics. It's what they're good at. You can see if I switch this over to the CPU, and I have a really high-end CPU as well. I have a 5950X. And you can see that it's it's really quite slow, whereas if I move this onto the GPU, everything's nice and quick. Now, another check that you'll want to do is go to Edit, Preferences, System, and look up here at Devices. You can see that we have lots of different devices. These two are both for NVIDIA graphics cards. Uh, CUDA is the older system. Optics is the newer one. Optics is 99% of the time going to be faster. I always just personally leave this on Optics. If you have an AMD card, you're going to want to use this one, HIP or HIP. I'm not, I'm not sure how that's supposed to be pronounced. You want to use this one, and I believe this one's for Intel graphics cards. You probably don't have one of those. So most people are going to have NVIDIA, I imagine, so you'll want to have optics on if your card supports it. We have two different options here um, for GPU and CPU. Now you might think, well, why wouldn't you turn them both on, right? Because obviously it'll be faster if you use them both. But actually you'll find that it's usually slower. It's not massively slower, but it will be slower. And the reason for that is because basically the CPU acts as a bottleneck. Because it's so much slower than the GPU, it's actually going to end up slowing everything down. Um, if I render out this scene here, it takes about 8 seconds. But if I have them both enabled, it takes like 12 or 13 seconds. So it really slows things down. Make sure that you've only got your GPU enabled if that's what you've got. So now all of the different settings that you're going to need to speed up cycles, you're going to find over here in the render panel, which is the top one on the side. So moving down, we have samples. Blender cycles, at least, is a path tracer. What that essentially means is it figures out the appropriate brightness and color for each pixel by breaking down the whole thing into a pixel grid. It sends out a ray, which is the sample, to the pixel, and then it bounces around in a random direction, and it tries to figure out what the average lighting that's going to hit that pixel is. So it's basically an estimation. Now, the more samples you have, the more accurate it's going to be, but the slower it's going to be as well. Personally, I leave the sample count on two or 300, and I do a quick test render. If that's not going to be enough, then I will increase the samples. But usually, all these tips I'm going to mention, I would use them before I would really put the sample count up, because more samples equals more time. Next to the samples, you'll also notice this one called Noise Threshold. What this basically does is it tells Blender, once a pixel has its noise reduced by a certain amount, just move on. Stop sending samples to it. There's no point resampling a pixel that isn't noisy. This is really handy um, to have on all the time. By default, you should just have this on. But basically, if you have a scene where one area of the frame is really noisy, but none of the rest of it really is that bad, this is great to have because it means the noisy pixels can have a high number of samples and all the other ones don't need them. You can change exactly how noisy something can be, but I would usually just leave that on default. Uh, time limit does exactly what you would think. If I set this to one second, then Blender will render the whole thing out, and once it's hit a second, it'll move on to the next frame. It doesn't matter how many samples have been sent out, it will just move on after that time. This is a really handy one. Let's say you have a certain number of frames, and you only have a certain amount of time to render them in. You can basically just divide however many frames there are by the time, and figure out what the most amount of time you can give each uh, render to. The minimum samples, once again, does pretty much exactly what you'd expect. 
let's say you put the noise threshold on, but you know you want everywhere to have at least 100 samples, then you can set 100 samples in there. Now, Blender also has denoising as well, which is basically an algorithm that looks at the noise and will try and reduce it, right? It knows what noise patterns look like, and it will try and get rid of it out of the render. You can turn it on in the viewport here, and you can see what this does. It goes from being really noisy to really clean. Now, denoising, I think, is fantastic. Sometimes it can be a little bit too aggressive. Um, if you're trying to denoise something which is just really, really noisy, it's going to look very smudgy. So you do need to be careful with it. It's not magic. It can't fix very, very noisy images. In Blender, we have two different uh, denoises these days. There's optics, which is great, especially if you have an NVIDIA card. The, the, this is the one that I used to use almost all the time. The main reason I used this instead of open image denoise was because this used to be slow. However, we now have an option down here for use GPU, which makes it much faster. I've been experimenting with this a lot lately, and it works really well. You don't really need to worry about all of these other settings too much for passes and pre-filter and things. They don't affect render times that much, and the what you lose by changing this to fast, for instance, um, in quality, isn't worth the extra speed increase, so I wouldn't bother touching that. Under here, we have this option for light tree. Most of the time, you want to leave this off. The light tree is a newish feature in Blender. What this basically does is it calculates the lights um, more efficiently if you have lots of lights in the scene. It figures out where the lights are and which ones are going to influence the scene. If you have thousands and thousands of lights, you might want to turn this on. Otherwise, it's probably just going to slow things down, so I would leave that off. If we open up advanced here, you probably don't need to touch this stuff. This just affects um, how the, the samples are actually distributed. So most of the time you can just leave that off. Sometimes the scrambling distance can be helpful to turn on. This uses a pattern of noise, which is kind of more uniform. It's a little bit less random. It can create artifacts, although usually I don't know what to send thing. Uh, I do, however, keep it off in the viewport at least because it does this kind of weird strobing thing sometimes when you're zooming in and out, whereas instead of being like nice and clean, it's not really doing it here, but it can do this weird, weird thing sometimes, so I would leave that off. Um, max, minimum light bounces, things like that, I, I wouldn't really touch. So light paths, this is how many bounces each type of light is basically going to get. Um, Blender, once a light is bounced around a certain amount of times, will cut off for different things. Most of the time, you don't really need to touch these. They don't make a huge difference on render times, to be honest. Uh, one thing you might want to be careful with is the transmission volume and transparent. If you have lots of layers of transparency, say you have loads of uh, glass materials, you want to make sure that it, this has a high number. Otherwise, it's only going to bounce through the glass three or four times, and then the glass will appear black. So underneath this, we have the clamping. This basically sets a, a ceiling on how bright pixels can be. So if I go into this view and I turn down the direct lighting to like 0.2, those lights can only be like 0.2 brightness. That's the maximum brightness they can be. I usually leave this set to something like between 5 and 15, and the same with the indirect lighting. I'm not too worried about turning direct lighting down too much, since it's actually visible to the camera. You do want it to be quite bright, but indirect lighting you can usually bring down quite far. Uh, you don't want to go too far with it, though, otherwise things will start to look potentially too dark. I would leave this on. Something like 5 is usually fine. Filter Glossy, basically, if you have a sharp highlight, what it does is it just blurs the highlight a little bit, and that can really reduce um, firefly noise. If something hits a very sharp highlight, it can make a really bright pixel, right? For instance, if we're checking this pixel over here, and we say, okay, well, where is this getting light from? Let's say the sample happens to hit this sharp highlight. That one could end up really bright. So by turning on a bit of uh, filter glossy, it's just going to kind of blur this and increase the chances that it's not a one-off. So I usually set this to something like three, 
Uh, caustics. This is one of those times where it's best just to check and see if it influences or not. If you don't have any glass in the scene, you're usually safe to turn this off. Sometimes it makes a difference, sometimes it doesn't. Just take a look at all the glass in your scene, try turning these off and see if things look weird with it off. Fast uh, GI approximation is fantastic, especially if you're working on interior scenes. I highly recommend that people turn this on. You can see that with it on, the light that's coming through this window looks really dark, but if we turn this up to two bounces, which is the number that I usually use, occasionally you have to go up to three to get everything looking right. This will save you render time and it doesn't really look that much different. It should look a lot more different, you would think, because it's doing a lot of faking, essentially. The light that gets bounced around in the corners and stuff, instead of working that all out, like, 100% realistically, it's kind of just faking things, but it works better than you would expect, is what I'm trying to say. Leave that on 90% of the time, but once again, like everything else, just check it and make sure it isn't making the scene look too weird or anything. Uh, under volumes here, we have this step rate render. Now, by default, this is set to one. If you use a higher number, you're essentially lowering the resolution. You can almost think of it of, as the, of the, uh, the volume. So let's say you have a box in your scene and it's got a volume uh, material on it to make some like fake fog or something like that. Usually you can get away with putting this number higher and you can also get away with the max steps which is how much the light is going to sort of bounce around in the volume. You can usually bring this right down to something like 100. Sometimes it can have a big effect on render times. It's worth playing with if you have fog or something in your scene and you've got slow renders. So motion blur can have an effect on render times as well. In fact, it can have a pretty drastic effect. One thing that I would usually do to make it a little bit faster is frankly just bring the shutter speed down. You'll have less motion blur, but it also won't take as long to render. Also, um, if you have a NVIDIA graphics card and you're using optics, that's done on the GPU and it's substantially faster. So that's another reason why you want to have that on GPU. Now, under film, I don't think there's anything we need. No, film is fine. Uh, performance... The compositor these days is GPU accelerated. You want to have that turned on because at the end of the day, compositing is part of the rendering process. Sometimes compositing can add several seconds onto a render, maybe even minutes if you've got some really high-end sort of fancy compositing tricks going on. I would leave this on GPU. I don't know if it is by default these days, but I think it should be. At threads, you don't need a touch. I would leave that well alone. Uh, memory, this is the, for the tile size. Blender basically will only try and calculate a certain amount of pixels at once. At the moment, this is set to 2000. So if you're rendering out something like 1080p resolution, you won't notice it. But if I put this down to like 200 and I render this scene out, you will see that Blender will start rendering out in tiles. And if you've been using Blender for a while, you'll know that this is how Blender actually used to render out every scene. I kind of missed this. I liked watching the, uh, the little tiles pop up. But now it's using like 2000 or whatever, 2048. So most of the time, you're not going to notice that and you don't really need to touch it. This option over here is also really important. This is probably going to be the last one that we really need to talk about. Persistent data. Um, basically, when you render out a frame, you might have noticed, especially if you've got a lot going on in the frame, lots of models and things, it has to sort of build the render before it starts actually rendering anything out. Before you see anything appear on the screen when it's doing all this, at the start, um, if you have persistent data enabled, instead of recalculating all that stuff every single frame, it will try and hang on to as much information as it possibly can and recycle everything. Now, back in the day, this used to quite often cause glitches. If you were rendering out, say, an animation, you might see, like, in one frame, this glass on the clock might not be transparent or on the window, or a light might just turn off for one frame. They've worked out most of those bugs, as far as I can see, in new versions of Blender. I don't remember the last time I had one of those problems, so I habitually just turn this on like by default i think in my startup file this is enabled 
So that just about covers everything. Thanks for watching this video, guys. Make sure you check out the link in the description where you can pick up the Essential Topology Guide 40% off until the end of November using the code 40OFF.